from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our Books and Beyond program. I'm Guy Lamolinar, and I'm from the Center for the Book here in the Library of Congress. For those of you who don't know a lot about the Center for the Book, we're a small division of the library that promotes books, reading, libraries, and literacy. And we also administer two other sections of the library, and that's the Young Reader Center, which is a great place for kids who are 16 and under to visit. And that's here in the Jefferson Building on the ground floor. And we also oversee the Poetry and Literature Center, which if you know anything about the Poet Laureate of the United States, then you know about our Poetry and Literature Center. Additionally, we administer the Library of Congress Literacy Awards, and we'll be announcing those this fall. Those are awards we give nationally and internationally to organizations like the Center for the Book that promote literacy here in this country and overseas. We carry out our mission of the Center for the Book with the assistance of 52 affiliated state centers for the book. We have one in every state, one in the District of Columbia, and we even have our newest one, which is in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So next time you're in the Virgin Islands, please visit the Center for the Book. We also have a partnership with 80 like-minded organizations that promote literacy, and we partner with them across the country to uh, uh, further our mission. Additionally, we play a very important role in the National Book Festival. We invite the authors, we organize the program, and this year's festival is Saturday, September 5th, and once again, we'll be going to the Washington Convention Center. And you may miss the National Mall if you've ever been to the, to the book festival before, but I guarantee you, you'll love the Convention Center. It's very comfortable there. We have air conditioning, and you can hear a lot better than you could on the mall. So please come to the National Book Festival, and to read more about it, it's at loc.gov slash bookfest. And since all of you are obviously interested in Rosa Parks, you should know that we also have a Rosa Parks biographer coming to the book festival this year, and that's Jean Theo Harris, who has written a new biography of Parks called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. So please come and listen to Jean and all the other authors at the festival. Before we get started, I just need to ask that you turn off all your electronic devices, please. And I need to tell you that we're recording today's event. So if you ask a question, you will become a part of our webcast. Speaking of our webcast, we have more than 200 of those available online at our website, which is at read.gov. So if you ever see a program that you cannot attend here at the library with an author, you can probably find that author's presentation on our website. Today's author's book will be for sale at 20% off. I urge you to get a copy of this, and the author will be here to sign it as well. So it's a great chance to get a great book signed by the authors. Um, we are often asked to determine how we have books in this Books and Beyond ser series since there are so many thousands of books published every year. But the most important criterion we have is that the, the book have some strong connection to the Library of Congress. And today's book about Rosa Parks obviously has that connection since our manuscript division is where the Rosa Parks collection is housed. And if afterwards, if you have some time, there's a great display next door of items from the Rosa Parks collection. I urge you to go over there and look at them. And here to tell us more about the library's collections is Helena Zinkum. Please welcome Helena. Good afternoon, everyone. You can hear me clearly? Yeah. All right. So as Guy mentioned, my name is Helena. I'm director for collections and services, which means I'm the privileged manager of where the Rosa Parks papers are stored and cared for, but also made available to the world. The book that we're going to learn about today, it's called Our Auntie Rosa. And many family members are here. It's a thrill, right, to be able to talk with people who actually knew Rosa Parks or who remember them from her youth. <laughs> um, and so most of the family members are seated in this portion of the room. Please introduce yourselves and also welcome them 
to Washington and the Library of Congress today. <clears throat> Last summer, when the Howard Buffett Foundation purchased the Rosa Parks personal papers and photographs, the library was very honored to be selected as the home for her um, collection. It's a tenure deposit arrangement. Why were we chosen? We like to think because we're one of the major institutions for the United States, your national library, and we have a long history of both acquisitions for African American history, but also women's history. Both worlds that Rosa, Mrs. Parks, I should say, <laughs> contributed to heavily. The Parks collection is in good company at the Library of Congress. Among our 158 million items in more than 470 different languages, major historical resources include the papers of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. And that's just for starters. There's 23 presidents here altogether. But we also have up-to-the-minute digital maps and vast genealogical databases, a wonderful place to come and seek out information. The records of the NAACP are not only one of our largest collections, but very heavily used. You can also turn to us, however, for the personal records of many people who fought long and hard for equal rights in different fields. For example, Susan B. Anthony, her papers are here. A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, Thurgood Marshall, Jackie Robinson, and more recently, Patsy Mink. And I've just touched the tip of this iceberg. We also offer remarkable oral history interviews with former slaves, spellbinding photographs from the March on Washington, newspapers, sound recordings, movies, music, books. All information formats are here at the library, ready for you to dive into. They are here because we hope to contribute to not just better understanding of the past, but to contribute to building a better future, whether that's political action or creative artistry, that's why these collections exist, for access, for inspiration. All right, so the Library of Congress was founded in 1800. That means we've already spanned three centuries of activity, fulfilling our role as your national library. With 15,000 new items added each day, I hope you'll forgive us that at times, it takes us a little while to absorb all this new material pouring in. But I want to tell you that when those boxes of Rosa Parks collection arrived last October, I think it was literally on Halloween, <laughs> the inspiration of Mrs. Parks' life, it's tangible. We couldn't put those boxes on a shelf, could we? They had to be opened right away, partly curiosity, what new could be revealed about her life, how might we better understand her life. But it really has come to feel like her mission to bring people together, to coalesce energy, it works for the collection as well. And so our crackerjack archivists, conservators, catalogers, experts in pictures, historians, our exhibition people, everyone is chipped in. <laughs> Education outreach officers. I've never seen a team like this before in the library. And we're all energized. The boxes are open. It took only three months to fully process the collection. The magic team is on this side of the room, I believe. <laughs> the finding aid, very detailed information and guide, online already, and the digitizing has started. So we are well on our way to making this collection widely available. The prints and photographs will be digitized next. And as a special treat, because this doesn't always happen with book talks, we've brought some of those original documents with us today and they'll be on display in the room just outside this one. So I hope you'll have a little time afterwards to stop and take a look. Um, all right. So back to Rosa Parks' talent for bringing people together. I would also like to mention that among the collection we have uh, some of her dresses, the many awards that she received, special furniture, the personal artifacts of her daily life. And I'm glad to introduce today uh, the members of the Smithsonian National Museum for African American History. They're filling the front row here on my right. <laughs> uh, of course, you will be introducing yourselves across the room. 
but I really appreciate your making the time to come today. Thank you. So the partnership expands to bring her collection back to life. Did I tell you that there's an exhibition on civil rights uh, that's upstairs on the, in the Jefferson Building, not far away, and some of her artifacts will be there displayed until January. Uh, so exhibition, conservation, archivists, everyone working together. It's been exciting. <laughs> but now for the main event. Sheila McCauley Keyes is here. Please come up. She describes herself as the seventh niece of Rosa Parks. Right there, I think you get an idea of a huge, wonderful extended family. And I am going to leave everyone in your good hands. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I am Sheila McCauley Keyes, and I'm going to tell you it's just such a pleasure being here. Uh, I'm so excited. I have um, some of my uh, contributors, family members are here joining me today. First, I uh, would like to introduce them. It is my nephew, Skylar, my niece, Whitney, my nephew, Broderick, and I have my brother, Robert McCauley, my sister, Susan McCauley, Deborah Ross, my other sister, and my cousin, Kathy Holmes, is here as well. So I um, wanted to uh, just go ahead and get started by uh, letting you all know that uh, we wrote this book to honor a beloved family member, and it has been a true labor of love. So I also wanted to let you guys know, too, that um, something about our family dynamics, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Rosa Louise McCauley Parks, uh, her brother was Sylvester James McCauley, and that is our father, and there were 13 of us. Um, so there were eight girls and five boys. And my aunt, Rosa, she helped to raise all of us. That was just what our family did. Um, so we decided to write this book about her after she had passed away. Um, our family, we just didn't get a chance to grieve her loss as a family would. We are very private people and we didn't get that chance so we decided to work on it this way by uh, putting our remembrances down on paper and sharing our photographs and we just started compiling you know, our memories and it came together as this book with some of the lessons that uh, she taught us because she helped to raise all of us. So <clears throat> that was uh, the main reason why we decided to uh, write this book and to share with the public some of the lessons and things that uh, our aunt taught us. I had um, a couple of uh, a couple of excerpts that I did want to read, but I would like my sister Deborah, if she would, would you like to read uh, Innocence Lost for me? First, no? <laughs> she, she would, she would, she would. She, she's serious. Okay, anything else stay up here? Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, today is a sad and joyous occasion, I guess you would say, um, to see the letters from my father and some of my brothers and sisters to, to my aunt, and some of her letters uh, brings back a lot of memories. And uh, What I'm going to read is... Uh, when I really realized uh, what kind of person she was and what she had to sacrifice. And I was about nine years old. I mean, I knew what she'd done, but I didn't really sink into the depth of what they went through, her and my uncle. So anyway, 
We always went to visit Auntie Rosa, Uncle Parks, and Grandma on Sunday. My father would bring them fruit and vegetables from his garden to last them the entire week. But one Sunday, one thing, something was different, and just a few of us rode with Father that day, while my mother and most of my brothers and sisters stayed home. Father didn't talk on the drive over and didn't tell us to sit back and be quiet like he usually did. As we drove up to the house, Auntie Rosa, Uncle Parks, Grandma, and some other adults were waiting on the porch. As soon as they saw my father walk up the steps, everyone started to talk at once. And I knew something was wrong when my brothers, sisters, and I were, weren't told to go inside or to the background, backyard to play. The adults in our family never discussed anything important around us. Grandma finally noticed the smaller kids and sent them into the house. I sat quietly off to the side of the porch so I wouldn't be noticed and sent away like the others. Whatever was going on, I wanted to hear about it. With the kids out of sight, or so they thought, the adults began passing around copies of the Jet and Look magazine. From my distance, several feet away, I caught a glimpse of a hor horribly disfigured face. It was a shocking open casket photo of Emmett Till. I heard them saying that this child, not much older than me, had been murdered, allegedly for whistling at a white woman in Mississippi. He was beaten beyond recognition, weighed down with a heavy cotton gin fan tied around his neck with barbed wire and thrown into the Tallahatchie River. Everyone was in an uproar. I listened intently as they discussed black folks who'd gone missing, along with others who were found hanging from trees, floating in rivers like Emmett Till had been. I suddenly been to, began to realize the risks that my aunt and uncle had taken to stand up against racism and how brave they truly were. Auntie Rose had broken the law on the public bus with no one there to protect her. If bigots could drag Emmett Till out of bed in the middle of the night, from a house filled with his family, what might they have done to my aunt with only strangers around? Jess's rage began to rise up inside my nine-year-old body. The conversation ended and the adults tucked away the magazines before going inside. As fate would have it, Auntie Rosa remained on the porch noticing me for the first time. I went up to her and all the emotions I felt poured out through tears. I hate white people, I said, shaking with anger. Auntie Rosa looked at me tenderly and put her hands on my shoulders to calm me down. All white people aren't bad, she said. Just remember, you're just as good as anybody. It was only a few gentle words, but they helped me through that very painful moment. I soon wiped my eyes and rejoined the family inside. It impresses me to know that not even the bloody terrorism of Southern hatred in the 50s Terrorism that snatched away children's lives could harden Auntie Rose's heart. Yet I still mourn for Emmett Till, a boy who went to Mississippi to visit relatives never to return, simply because of the color of his skin, the color of my skin. So that, I mean, that, I think that was the first time I really realized, you know, what kind of person that she was. So. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> That goes to um, Auntie Rose's spirit. Um, she was kind, loving, tolerant. Uh, she didn't have like a bad bone in her body. She treated everyone the way that she wanted to be treated and not the way that they treated her. That was one of the lessons that she tried to instill in us is to follow the golden rule is something that uh, her mother, Leona McCauley, taught her and my father to follow this golden rule no matter what. And it's so hard to do to treat a person the way you want to be treated and not how they treat you. That's a hard thing to do. But I think if everyone, you know, would attempt that, we would live in a better world. I think it would be much better. But that was one of her, <clears throat> one of the lessons. Other than uh, she also taught us too that we were responsible for our own actions. That was another one. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
that she taught us, which I really, really appreciate it because sometimes we have to learn that the hard way, but uh, just so we do. <laughs> so that is a good thing. <clears throat> I had uh, uh, some other uh, excerpts or parts of excerpts that I would like to read. Um, there was uh, one from our encouragement chapter and uh, it was when our family came to Washington, D.C. in 2013, there was a statue unveiled in her honor um, at the Capitol building. And there was a question that was asked to me over and over. What would she think of this? What, you know, what would she think about all this going on, all the hoopla around her? I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know. But I had to sit down and write and uh, really think about that question. And I did, and I um, put it in the book. I think um, this is a part of what I had wrote. Um, I think that uh, she would appreciate being remembered and being loved, and she would appreciate it sincerely but this appreciation can never replace her sense of pure values. That Auntie Rosa became the object of so much admiration during her lifetime was more than she had ever expected. That she is still the object of such admiration in death reminds us just how much she would want personal praise to be given its true perspective. She would want everyone who buys her stamp to buy it with the confidence that they could do remarkable things just as she did. She would want every visitor to the Capitol, whoever gazes upon her statue, to also gaze upon a vision becoming reality of communities where the poor prosper and the suffering prevail. From every gracious senator, member of Congress, and legislative aide that we met in Washington to the least notable, notable face in the crowd of spectators paying tribute at the birthday observance, our aunt would have viewed them as equals. Auntie Rosa knew how wrong people had been to dismiss her and those she represented, and she knew how much she had been underestimated at one time. She was a woman who showed leadership without ever once in nearly 100 years of living holding a formerly designated title or rank. She would become great simply by acting on what she believed. And that was one thing about her. If she knew something was right, she would stick to it. She would hang in there and work for what she believed. She wouldn't give up. She, she was a, a true champion. And I think that's another reason why we wrote the book, because she was our champion. And it is a way of honoring honoring her as a family. So I think that is one of the uh, excerpts that I, I really, really enjoyed writing. I don't know if anyone has any questions about, uh, anyone have any questions they would like to ask about the, well, yes. Hi. You know, I'm just curious about how you let, you know, I can never get people in my family to agree on anything. How do you <laughs> get people to sit down and compile all these thoughts and put it together in a book? How does this actually happen? It was very rough. It was very hard. <laughs> it's a labor, it's labor. It was, um, I think I had to uh, tap into my aunt's. Uh, thinking a little bit there because uh, she always said, if you believe in what you're doing, you know, you stick with it. And I thought this was just, just a wonderful way to honor her. It was just an excellent project. And what had happened, uh, my aunt passed away in 2005. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, uh, but we were a private family and we, didn't get that chance to grieve her loss as a family would. We grieved in public. There were three large uh, funerals, one in uh, Detroit, one in Washington, one in Alabama. 
and whereas uh, our family, she was a uh, mother, father figure to us after our parents, uh, uncle and grandmother had passed away. That's who we went to, our go-to person. She was our family. And so uh, when she died, uh, it was so public, we didn't get the chance to grieve her loss. And that was one way that it did pull us together because we were grieving and we needed to do this. So we needed to do it to share and because she was so smart. She was so fearless. She was, she was so many things. She encompassed a lot. She, she was just a great woman. And so I think that uh, uh, it was just something for us to do to get over something. But in the process, we found out we had something to give others, you know, other than us grieving and crying. We had something to give. You know, we had something of this woman that we want to share. So that's, uh, and it was hard, yes, because when you have so many moving wheels, it's, it's really, you know, you really have to reel people in. But my family, they wanted to do it, so it worked out really, really well. So, and I have uh, so many members here that I can attest to that. I started out with 50, but I have eight. <laughs> so I did, <laughs> it did work. <laughs> yeah, so it was really something. And it took seven years. So it, it didn't happen over, overnight either because our family, we're not celebrities. We're an American family. So who wants to take a chance on an American family? If you're not a celebrity and doing strange things in public. So and we, we weren't, we were just private people. But the push was still there. We believed in it. And like Aunt Rosa said, when you believe in it, you, you keep going. You get your result, but you have to keep going. So um, that was the way, that's how we done it. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, I did have uh, another little something I wanted to read, and it's from a vision chapter. And uh, it, I believe this was written by, I'm just going to read a little. It was written by uh, my nieces and nephews, Alan, Lonnie, Terrence. So Terrence and Thomas are my sons, actually. Whitney and Broderick are right there. And I'm just going to read uh, just a small section of this uh, excerpt. As the bearers of the Macaulay name, most of us accept it as an obligation to carry onward in ways that would make Auntie Rosa proud of all of us and reflect the work she did while she was alive. We're grateful that the same blood she had runs through all of our bodies and that we saw her in the private light few other people could, as well as observing her in the public side. She was a model of grace regardless of who was watching. She was a model of dignity, even when she faced less than dignifying circumstances. Realizing that we fall into the same peer group as the grandchildren of Malcolm X, Meg Evers, Viola Luizzo, makes us, makes it even more clear that we have to represent the best of Auntie Rosa as the heroes would surely want younger generations of their families to represent the best of them. I think that that was really important for, uh, we call them our next generation, uh, really important for them to say that because they're trying to uh, uphold a standard, you know, her standard, even though it might be difficult but, but we can do this, and it's just for all young people. We can do this. We can uphold that standard. We can live and be the best that we can be. So I think that uh, Auntie Rosa would approve of uh, her grandnieces and nephews, of what they wrote right there. I really like that. So I thought that that was pretty nice. I don't know if anybody else had any questions about anything. That I read because I'm willing to answer. Hi. Hi. Um, I think I'm going to ask this question, but could you speak to the uh, the Muslim community and the Muslim community that you have here in
in the past few years, uh, uh, we've been uh, rather quiet. I, I don't think that uh, many people would, didn't even believe we were related to Rosa Parks at first, but uh, since she's died, they, they do know, you know, who the family is. It's been little in the media, you know, so they do know that she had, they call us heirs, she had heirs, but we're really, we're her nieces and nephews, that's what they call you in court. But anyway, uh, she did have a family, and I haven't had any uh, negative response other than people when I was younger not believing me, I was even related to her. So it's like, to me, why say, I, I never went around saying, hey, guess what? That lady over there, that's my aunt. I, I never said that because uh, nobody believed me anyway. So that was like, when I say we were a private family, we, we kept a lot of stuff was just, just private. She was Auntie Rosa to us, and what she had done many, many years ago was something she had done, she had done. But she had uh, been working prior to that all along in the movement, she had done so much work, but that was what she was, uh, n had notoriety for, I believe, was the bus incident. But uh, I think uh, I can attest to after viewing all the, the uh, items, manuscripts, letters, and pictures next door, uh, a lot of her collection, it, she, she, uh, full of surprises, you know, and I, I learn more and more about her, more and more about her every day. And I think this trip, I've learned a lot. I've learned uh, uh, really a lot about her. So I don't know if anybody else had any more questions. Okay. I don't think it's one single, the, the, the most important thing I think you probably would take away from it. Uh, she was very family oriented. And if you go uh, to look at uh, some of the uh, items in the collection, you will notice that uh, photographs, the people are in the photographs are right in the room. Uh, you know, so you, you will take away that away from it. That she was very family oriented. And so it was a very, emotional to just look at your history laid out on the table and proud moment to be, you know, intertwined into history. I think it's, it's really, really fabulous, you know, so I don't know if anybody else had any questions. Oh, yeah. Now, I know that he was uh, their leader, and I think that, Robert, would you like to speak to that one? But you could come up. Yeah, sure. This is my brother, Robert, Robert McCauley, and I know that he, uh, he was one that talked a lot in the book about, uh, <laughs> what did you say? Oh. Is, is that water? Yeah. Can I some? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are you playing this on? <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is Robert, and I'm Sheila's brother. Uh, the thing with uh, uh, Martin Luther King and, uh, and Rosa was that uh, when she was arrested, and some of you know this, and some of you who don't would probably be interested in knowing it, that he, uh, he, he was their pastor in uh, the Dexter Avenue uh, AME Church. And uh, so when she was arrested uh, December 1st, 1955, uh, uh, she called him, being her pastor, she called him and uh, uh, pastor, I'm in jail. Uh, you know, uh, come and get me or you know, what do you want to do? They arrested me because uh, uh, a bad law uh, 
that the segregation is made, uh, saying the blacks had to get up and move to the back of the bus when, uh, when uh, you know, whites came in and wanted to sit down. And uh, so uh, he was uh, very upset at that. And uh, so they, uh, uh, Martin and uh, uh, other members of the congregation uh, decided to, uh, you know, we, we're going to have to do something about that. Because she was a, a well-respected member of the community. Mm -hmm. and she, was, she was held in high esteem. And uh, she, Rosa was uh, very much uh, spiritually aligned. She was a spiritual person. Uh, and uh, I just wish I had some of the spirituality that she had. <laughs> but uh, I'm working on it. But uh, nevertheless, though, uh, the bus boycott came as a result of that arrest. And uh, it, it, was, it was the impetus or the spark needed to uh, start the, uh, the modern day civil rights movement. Uh, a blaze. Uh, now there, there had been civil rights uh, uh, before Rosa came on the scene, but uh, the one part of the catalyst that was missing was uh, uh, a spark to ignite the whole thing and to uh, get the uh, Jim Crow segregationists, uh, you know, something else to think about other than having folks move to the basket back of the bus and throwing scraps out the back door of the restaurant and saying, uh, you boys, you know, go to the back and we got a little bit of chicken feed you can get and go to the back and here, here you go and take this scrap, you know. But well, that's, without going into much detail about that, but well, that, that's where uh, the start of the, uh, the modern day civil rights movement began, where she was arrested December First, 1955. That uh, that was um, uh, the uh, I won't say it was a cornerstone, but it was key. And uh, with with every with every movement, every movement you got to have a mother. Mm -hmm. you, you agree with that? Exactly. You you got to have someone to come along and to give birth to it and to nurture it. Uh, she was a very uh, uh, patient and, and loving woman. She, uh, she was very tolerant of people who uh, simply, uh, if, you, if you disagree with, with her about something, uh, she, she would not uh, condemn you because of that. Uh, she, she would hear you out. And uh, even though she knew that you possibly could be wrong, you know, and she just said, well, you know, that person is entitled to their opinion too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think though that, uh, that uh, without uh, that spark, that uh, perhaps they would still be throwing scraps out the back of the door, you know, yeah. or, or out the back door, or, or telling folks, hey, you gotta get up, move to the back. Uh, it always says to me, uh, for my take on it, it, it takes someone who has the courage and is brave enough to speak up when something is wrong. Mm -hmm. there, there are many things that are still wrong in society today. Uh, well, who, who will that person be, that next person? Perhaps Sheila, perhaps myself, perhaps my sister Deborah, or one of my nieces and nephews. But uh, it's... Uh, it is amazing, and she would always say that uh, uh, there's still much more work to be done. Mm -hmm. I am beginning to realize, uh, in terms of you know what that work is, uh, because it, it's not just uh, what we see in public for our, our view. It's not just that. It's uh, it's also our families. You know how we relate to each other's families, and uh, because that that's. Plainly put, that's, that's where it all starts, with the family. I mean, it, when the family goes, there goes the nation. So uh, if we get our families uh, uh, going uh, in the right direction, uh, then the nation pretty much will follow. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that, that, was, that was pretty much her take on it. Uh, 
She would listen to people and uh, not put you down if you had differences. But uh, you, you asked about her relation between uh, Martin and herself. And uh, of course, uh, uh, she, was, uh, she was in his congregation and he was a pastor. And he, uh, he uh, you know, he, as a congregation member, of course, he, he, he looked out for his flock. And uh, so he was a person uh, that was highly, uh, you know, considered uh, uh, to be an upstanding community member. And uh, he, he knew that something had to be done about this. And it, it was high about time that someone had stood up and, and, and told those uh, Jim Crow guys, that, hey, this, this is not right, you know. Uh, you can't treat Americans this way. And, uh, and, and that was the beginning of it. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like even though there's uh, much more work yet to be done, then, uh, boy, did we get a good start. That's all I have to say. Did I talk too much? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bob. Uh, Thank you, thank you, Robert. <laughs> yeah, so that, with that, I don't know if I'm, I'm running out of time. Right on time. Okay. Yeah. I've got a question I'd love to ask. Okay, Helena. One of my favorite parts about this book is the, of course, the many personal stories told mm -hmm. of how uh, Mrs. Parks was a strong force and daily presence in her family's life mm -hmm. with 13 kids and wonderful nieces and nephews. And you're mentioning that no one would believe you if you said Rosa Parks was your aunt. But there was one day in Southern California for a show and tell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the nephew that... needed something for show and tell. And guess what? <laughs> Rosa Parks turned up. Wow. Because that's got to be the best ever. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, for me at least, reading the book, mm -hmm. a great feeling of the warmth and care not just for a nation, but for many individual people. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the lessons and so forth. But the book also has her recipes in it. And then there's this page where you talk about she's remembered as a pack rat. And I think those of us from the Smithsonian and Library of Congress as our professional interest, we would love to know what was it like to visit her house? I mean, are, are there just piles? Okay, the heads are nodding. Files everywhere. Mm -hmm. The serious part about the book is that she saved her hate mail as well as the yes. Mail. Yes. That's the context. But remember, as a pack rat, what did that look like? Well, uh, as you, the, the room next door is only a small portion of how her, her house, she would stack things, she would save things. She was a cons uh, conservationist, she would uh, a recycler. She would save jars, she would save foil, she would save plastic bags, everything was reusable. She got rid of nothing. And I, my, my son, Tommy, would run around her house and knock all those little, she saved baby food jars, I don't, just don't know why, but she saved them, and all on the car. He would knock them all over. I was a, uh, you know, he was just a little kid, two years old. But uh, she didn't throw anything away. I think she was uh, a woman that was far before her time. She could just see things. My father was like that as well. They could see things. You know, I think if you go next door and if you read some of the, the letters back and forth between the two of them, you get an idea of the closeness of their relationship. <clears throat> they were very close, my, uh, the three of them, my grandmother. Uh, my aunt and my father. But um, yeah, Santi Rosa was uh, quite uh, quite the pack rat. And you can imagine how that room looks, Helena, how her house looked. But there were magazines, newspapers, and everything else, along with the pictures and all that other stuff. So, my, and she loved books. She was an avid reader, she loved books. So that was one thing she would do, because that wasn't allowed uh, during uh, Jim Crow era, it just wasn't allowed. So she loved reading. She moved here. That was one thing she would do is go to the library. And she uh, encouraged 
us to read and keep learning as well. You can learn something new every day. Nobody has to make you do it and it's something you should want to do. So that's how uh, she was. And um, yeah, the, there's a lot of uh, cute stories in, in this book. Can somebody call me? Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. One of the collections that we have is the Black Fashion Museum collection. And in that collection is a dress that was made by a new aunt and that she was working on at the time that she was actually arrested. I'd love to know a little bit more about her as a seamstress and how did she learn to uh, sew? What was her inspiration? Did she create her own design? Now, I'm going to. Uh, refer to my sister Deborah because uh, Deborah, she also taught Deborah how to sew. She, you know, by the time I came along, way down the line, she's like, get y'all. But she did teach the, the uh, my elder siblings how to sew and she also made clothing for them and in return, Deborah made clothing for uh, my aunt because in the next room, there's several photos with the favorite dress she used to wear that Deborah did make for her. And I think that Deborah could tell you a little more about uh, her. And <laughs> <laughs> My sister is giving me the side eye. I'm so sorry. <laughs> She's like looking at me like, I know you didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And she sews beautifully. I can't sew. I can't sew a straight line. It's just something. It's something that some of us girls can do. Hi. Huh? Did your aunt ever talk about whether she had any fears or doubts about breaking the law? Mm, now, I think that. Uh, I don't think she had fear about that because she, I think she was doing what she thought was the right thing to do. And she knew what could happen to her. She knew the consequences of doing that because she had seen, uh, just from a small child growing up, she had seen what could happen to somebody that disobeyed, you know, the law or the, the uh, Jim Crow laws there. People would disappear in the middle of the night you know, and they'd just be gone forever. So she knew that something could happen to her, but I think she was very courageous because she had seen so much that she just said, and then even reading some of her letters she wrote, this has to stop. And this, it was just seeing what she said. I was flabbergasted. I knew she had those thoughts, but to see it written in her own hand, this has to stop, you know, and that's what she was saying. You know, and I was like, wow, she was a firecracker. You know, you know, you just see like a little old lady with a hat. Nothing like that. <laughs> Nothing like that. She she has some stuff going on. So I just said, wow, after, you know, just reviewing part of the collection. Yes. Uh, one thing that, that's so amazing to me is that y'all, you, you continue to talk about the strength and everything. Mm -hmm. and I think that um, just uh, like in the book, I alluded to uh, it's several incidents of her being bullied. She was a little skinny, little skinny child, and she would get pushed around. But she was always, and even back then, uh, you know, she could have been killed. You know, in the wink of an eye, she could have been killed. She is always picking up sticks or something and gonna, you know, attack somebody back. And grandma's like, ah, oh, no, Rosa, what's wrong with you? And she, she's trying to, you know, from being a little kid, she's ready to ball up her fist. Oh no, you're not gonna do that to me. That was, you know, her mindset. But um, I think that she, she was a willful child, even you know, from coming up, and she knew right from wrong. You know, she knew some things were wrong and they you know, needed to be corrected from early on. And you can see that in her writings. I, I just saw that, I was like, wow, she was, you know, thinking about this 
way in advance. You just think one day she decided in 1955, when she was 42, to sit on this bus. But she was thinking about it when she was a kid, and she wrote about it. She wrote on everything. I didn't know that either, on napkins, pieces of paper, bags. I was like, oh. But she was writing on everything. I was like, wow. You know, so I think she would have made a great writer just from reading some of those letters. That was very interesting. Hi. Yes, and my sister Susan is. <laughs> she giving me the side eye too, y'all. I'm telling you, every time I say and, I point. My sister Susan did travel some with my aunt, didn't you, Sue? Just a couple of times. Good. <laughs> they so shy. <laughs> she did. Yeah. So my sister did travel with her, and. She'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Come on, Sue. Susan. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I, I went um, for, for one week. I went, I traveled with uh, Auntie Rosa. And I believe I was in my 30s. But it was exhausting. It was exhausting. Uh, speaking engagements. Um, I would be seated where, where you guys are now, and she would speak. We'd go to dinner, we'd go back to the hotel, airports. I was so tired. I said, how is she doing it? But she did. She had, um, she was focused on what she was doing. And it was just amazing. I got back home, I, I couldn't, I don't know how she did it. But, um, and she was always uh, poised and always, she never complained. I would, as she got older and I would see her, um, she was obviously tired and she would be on stage, she would fall asleep waiting to speak. And I would ask her, uh, Auntie Rosa, you know, why don't you just go home, get some rest, you know, uh, why are you so driven? And she said that it was still work to be done. It was still work to be done, and it was almost like she was trying to get everything done before she passed away. But it was a privilege, and, and um, I, I enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs> She's like, Thank you. Hi. Can you talk a little bit about the activism before the Hustle White Paper? You mentioned in your book something about uh, how she represented the uh, Hustle White to investigate uh, uh, an incident in Africa, Alabama? Yeah, I think there was a young man accused of raping a white woman, but they were actually involved. But when they got caught, the woman said that, oh, yeah, he raped me. He was arrested, and I think he was eventually, I think he was eventually uh, executed. And my aunt worked on that case. She documented that case, but she couldn't get them to overturn his conviction. And I think that was really, really sad for her because she worked really hard because she knew this wasn't the case. And a lot of times, that's what happened. You got caught. But you, you know, to save face or something, you end up executing a, a person for, for no reason, for something consensual, just for the wrong color. So it was, it was wrong, you know. So the person ended up being executed. So I think that hurt, hurt her because she worked so hard. And she worked on several cases. That wasn't the only one. And uh, she was an Eastern star. A friend of mine sent me some information from Abbeville. And you know, he said, did you know about a month or two ago that your aunt was an Eastern star? I was like, uh, no, I did not. I actually did not. My aunt uh, uh, 
said, well, uh, one never really knows another person, you know, and you never do because she had many surprises and I'm still getting surprises. And this was a big one coming to uh, the Library of Congress and seeing, wow, everything, like in the book, it was all coming together. So it was so exciting and so emotional, you know. So it was really interesting. We have a round of applause. I met Jean Theo Harris, and I thought it was a good book. I met her, uh, when did I meet her? It was uh, my aunt's 100th birthday at the Henry Ford Museum in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, where the bus is housed. So that's where I met her, and her book had just came out. So I did get a chance to meet with her and speak with her. So I thought that it was a pretty good book. It was pretty informational, you know, so I liked it. Yeah, and she's a nice lady. <laughs> okay, and so I, I did want to give you guys this book. Thank you. Okay, but I'm going to remove this, these things, and I am giving a copy of Our Auntie Rosa to the Library of Congress. They have been so wonderful with uh, the contributor's signatures in it. I'm donating it to the Library of Congress, keep it here. Thank you so much. This and will be a wonderful gift. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, that was a wonderful program. It really was. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.